He's the master and I'm the servant. And the servant merely stands close to the master to listen to what he says. Well, if crises could bring people together, Christ can do it more effectively and with a lasting quality. But it takes humility, it takes the melding together of the uh, goal uh, of our lives. You know, looking uh, down the road to the uh, end of the trail, however far away that is, I think the thing that uh, increasingly governs me, and you can call it by any number of terms, but I, I have never felt more dependent on the grace of God in my life. And we all know that life is lived by grace. But it seems that uh, the privilege of broadened service that comes with uh, years of faithfulness that people perceive they welcome you, such dependence, because they're depending on what you offer to some degree, even as in the conversations we're having. But the helplessness that I feel in myself, dependency on the Lord. Well, I'd follow up on that, Jack, uh, by saying two things. Uh, for communication, only what happens to you can be communicated through you. And for administration, people can support only what they've shared in developing. I guess as I, as I get uh, older, uh, and I find myself having to confess and more willing to confess my hurts, I think, I think it has a lot to do with, um, I, I feel it even in my family. I find myself often now just loving my wife more, but asking her to forgive me. And, and, and I'm also depending more on, on, the, on the grace of God and the word of God. I'm depending on the spirit of God. When I preach now, I don't depend as much on my words as I depend on the spirit to do something that I can't even express. Yeah. Uh, an attitude that is within us when we are effective in releasing what God wants to do through us by his grace is the, what Paul brought out first in his lineup of Ephesians 4 was humility. And I think humility is what I see in you as you're describing uh, what you say to your wife or to your congregation. And I think that's what we recognize in each other. And uh, the other part of that would be uh, the seventh fr fruit of the Spirit, which is uh, self-control. And I think that's, again, by grace. So grace is, is uh, in the middle of the two pieces of bread. We're trying to buy the hotel and make it our campus in Kona. And there was so much greed demonstrated because it was in bankruptcy court, 14 lawyers fighting over equity and all of this. I, I had never been to court, first of all, but this greed was so obvious. And I thought, oh God, what do we do? And the Lord said, minister in the opposite spirit. And that was a new phrase to me. So it came out of that time. And I said, well, what's opposite of greed, Lord? He said, generosity. Generosity. And I began to understand that, you know, we talk a lot about spiritual warfare and strongholds and all of this, that it's walking like Jesus would walk that destroys the strongholds. It's talking like he talks. It's praying like he prays. It's the whole gamut of our lives that really pull down the spiritual strongholds that Paul mentions in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He's the master and I'm the servant. And the servant merely stands close to the master to listen to what he says. And if he senses that he's got your heart wholeheartedly, then he reveals what he's doing. And that's God's invitation for you to join him. I've always felt that when God chooses to let you know where he's at work, 
that's automatically his invitation for you to join him. If you're his servant, why would he, why would the master show a servant what he's doing if it was not that he wanted that servant to adjust his life immediately into the activity of the father? My, uh, my father is a professional cyclist. He died in uh, 2001, but uh, a legend in his field, and I've watched him even at 80s just pass other people like chariots of fire. And I asked him, Dad, how do you do that? And he said, son, it's not how you start the race, it's how you finish that counts. And I, when I was very early as a Christian, we were doing Bible quizzing and I came across, we just wrote thousands and thousands of questions out. We we're actually jumping for questions, not for answers. And in YFC where I worked, I saw a typed set of questions. Didn't think it looked through, interesting. Two weeks later, I'm in this quiz, and I found myself jumping after two words and realized that the thing I'd read was the National Bible Quiz. Now, there's 2,000 kids watching there, and what you should do is stand up and go, I'm sorry, I already read this, so it's disqualified. But instead, I just said, I'll jump more slowly. We lost the quiz, but I was so overwhelmed with guilt and some of the devil's little friends came and said, you're going to be a minister and you cheated on a Bible quiz? And I was out of it. I was going to leave the ministry. I said, I can't do this thing. I'm going to go back to being a chemist. And I had a, a picture in my mind, not a vision. I saw a man running and I saw his shoelaces untied in the mud on the side of the track and he stood on them and he went straight down on his face. And he started crying and I could see the tears running down his cheeks. And the crowd went crazy and they all stood up and they all yelling and I said, get, get up. And I thought, he's crazy. And the Lord said, yes. And I got up and I tied my shoelaces and I kept running. Uh, I've been uh, running ever since. You've been watching a short excerpt from Conversations with Fathers of the Faith. This series will enable you to sit with the six battle-tested fathers of the faith that include Henry Blackaby and Jack Hayford openly sharing their hearts in your presence. As you identify with their collective wisdom, you will be drawn to a higher level of desire towards the Lord Jesus and his church. This leadership collection is available to you now for £47.50 postage paid. To place your order, call now on 01922 492 099.